time for yet another handy Chinese industrial control module. And this time, it's a fake Omron H3Y-2 timer. If you search for H3Y-2 timer, you will find these. And not sure what listing I originally got this from, but it was easy to find another one. This is a double pole. This particular listing is for four pole uh, changeover. And the cost is minuscule. It's £3.51 for one of these. And you can get them in 1 second, 5, 10, 30, 60 seconds. And 3 minute to 5, 10, 30 and 60 minute ranges. And if we take a closer look down at this one, you'll see that this one is actually a 0 to 60 second. It's marked under the dial there. But... I've found that the range kind of starts at 15 seconds, so if you're wanting to use a timer like this, choose one that's sort of middle of the range. Say, for instance, if you want something for 20 to 30 seconds, then the 0 to 60 seconds, will, or I suppose ultimately the 0 to 30 seconds one might do. If in doubt, get one of each, they're not that expensive. So if I, uh, if I set this one up fully at 60, it does actually time out after 64 seconds. If I just leave it down at zero, it times out in between 10 and 15 seconds. Let me demonstrate. So when I power this up with 12 volts, because it is a 12 volt model, you shall see the PW LED light up. And after a suitable time delay, as it uh, counts down inside, the UP LED will light up. Not quite sure what UP means. It doesn't mean output power. Not sure. But click, you heard the relay click in, and that's timed out. And I found with this, uh, as you turn it up, uh, the, that delay more or less stays the same until suddenly it starts kicking into the proper delay. And at around about 20 or 30 seconds, well, actually from about 15 seconds upwards, it is quite reliably accurate. It's pretty good that way. So let's uh, open it up, shall we? So I'll pop this out the base. And you can see we've got the two power pins, and this is polarity sensitive, it just won't work if you connect it the wrong way around, it won't damage it. And then it's got the commons and then the changeover contacts. You could just buy this and solder onto the contacts, I'd recommend putting it into a base. Applications where this might be used, where is my spudger? Uh, a star delta starter. A star delta starter is a way of, uh, it's a way for starting three phase motors. And uh, they initially start with the windings connecting a star configuration, and then a timer like this. Where is this coming out? Yes, it is coming out. A timer like this then, after it's timed out, after the motor's run up to speed, this timer will click in. The delta contactor will cut in. It connects the uh, windings in a delta format, which is the full power. And it then it cut that automatically, by default, cuts the star uh, winding out the contactor. So um, this is that's a place that this could be used. Or it could be used to detect when something has been run too long and to cut it off. That came out easy and expected. I thought it was going to be tied onto this. I thought I was going to have to pick this off the front, but it didn't. So what do we have here? We have, let's uh, zoom in just a little bit closer. We have what looks like a fairly standard relay here with a 12 volt DC call. This is exactly the type of relay that you'd find in the other uh, modules that just have the clear plastic cover over the top, but this one has a circuit board. I'm guessing that's a transistor to switch on the... Uh, Really, there's a potentiometer on top, there's the two red LEDs, there's the chip. Now, is this going to be a dedicated timer chip, or is it going to be a little microcontroller, or is it going to be some just standard logic? It's a CD4541B. Not sure if you can actually see that. Can you see that? Uh, right, so that is a pretty standard CMOS chip. I'm not sure exactly what that does. Right, tell you what then, I'm going to pause momentarily and reverse engineer this. So it turns out that this is an absolutely standard timer chip. It's basically got a, inside it's got an oscillator uh, and a counter and you can set various ranges with uh, little uh, solder pads on the, well, connecting the pins in different configurations. You've got a and B. Hold on, let's uh, let's take a more accurate look at that. Let's uh, zoom down a little bit and move this into a more appropriate position. So it's got various functions you can set. It's got the A and the B pins that set the number of divider stages from the initial oscillator, so it can range from just 256 counts right up to 65,536. And this particular unit is going for the maximum range, and that's probably going to give it the greatest accuracy. 
It's got an oscillator inside, but it requires external components for timing, and those are the components that are used to set the time range. It's got various other modes. You can have auto reset on or off. Uh, that allows you to reset it externally if you want a lower current reset, or it can reset by default when you power it up. That's what this is set for. Master reset is off. Uh, the output, you've got the choice of the output stage. If we look over here at, I'm going to move this little bit of paper out of the way, it's just getting in the way now. If you look at the output stage, you can select whether it's going to go high or low by this exclusive OR gate here, because when it's finished timing out, uh, it will compare, the output of that NAND gate will change. And you can set that on one of the options. I'm just hitting everything on my bench here. <clears throat> and if you set that uh, to low, the output is initially low and then it goes high after the timer, but you can also change it to go uh, high and then reset to zero to go low when the time's timed out. You also have the single transition mode, which this is set in, which means that after the time delay, the relay will change over, or you've got recycle mode, where it will actually toggle on and off. I think, uh, I don't think it just resets and does the timer. I guess it would be toggling on and off. And again, that would be what they call a symmetric recycling timer. So let's uh, take a closer look at this. I'll, I'll actually let you look at the little schematic because you might find it quite interesting. I'll just pause momentarily while you take a snapshot of that if you want. And uh, the I've reverse engineered it. Let's uh, bring in the exhibit here. Let's zoom out so we can actually see the exhibit. And then, in fact, zoom back in so you can see more of it. Okay. So we start off with the 12 volts come in. And there is polarity protection. It's on the zero volt rail, so the diode is actually pointing towards the zero volt. If the diode had been put in the pot 12 volt rail, it would have been pointing in. And uh, after that, you've got the relay is connected to the positive 12 volt rail, and it's switched the zero volt rail by this transistor. And there's a uh, snubber diode across that for the back EMF spike off this coil. That diode is there just basically to protect the trans transistor because as the field collapses, if the transistor's open circuit, you'll get quite a high voltage spike and that just protects it. You'll see it across most relays and uh, solenoids and things like that. In the case of pinball machines, it's usually mounted directly at the coil and it's quite a common mistake to actually connect it the wrong way around and if you do that, it shorts out the coil and it, uh, well, with the diode and it blows up the diode and transistor. The timer, in this case, is based on this potentiometer here, this variable uh, potentiometer here, which is 1 mega ohm, and it's in series with 18K, which is basically to set the absolute minimum it goes down to. We've got a 1 nanofarad capacitor, which is the timing component, and that is this little red component here. And we've got a 220K, which uh, uh, caught me out at first. I didn't realise I didn't spot it sneaked right in at the end here. Uh, and actually with its solder joints underneath the chip. And that forms the oscillator, and it runs at a speed that's variable according to how you set the knob in the front of the panel. The chip itself has a power supply that's got a diode, which then feeds down to a standard 4.7 microfarad electrolytic capacitor, and that just basically decouples it. It makes it independent from the line, so if the line jitters up and down a lot, if there's a lot of noise in it, as you might find in an industrial environment, uh, that sort of softens it. And it goes one step further. It uses a 100-ohm resistor. Uh, there's the electrolytic capacitor. There's the 100-ohm resistor here, um, and it uses that. Uh, and a Zener diode, which is on the other side, it's actually this tiny little Zener diode just poked in there, and it uh, caps it to round about 9.7 volts. Quite an odd voltage, that. I'm not sure, is that a standard Zener value? I'll have to check that up. After that, the power LED is a high-efficiency LED with a 10K resistor uh, lighting the LED. The reason they're using a, such a high value of resistor is because the current uh, draw is, is limited by that resistor. You don't want it to start dissipating too much power by having to uh, supply too much current, although having said that, even at 12 volts, um, that's able to supply quite a lot of current, but this is a CMOS chip, it doesn't draw much current. The output um, is via another 10K resistor and LED, but then it goes to the base of the transistor. It's a, a sort of just an economic way of doing things. It means that all the current to light the LED is going through the transistor and turning that on, and that brings the relay on. And after that, it's just basically, you've got your power pins, you've got the A and the B are set uh, to high to change that timing range. 
and you've got the uh, the reset pin is tied low, and it's that's basically it. It's just configured with various options. Uh, there are solder pads on here that look as though they're designed to be bridged or little uh, links put in to change the range. But I'm wondering if uh, they actually just, I suppose, ultimately, they may just use the same circuit board for a wide series of ranges. The only thing they'd really need to change is the timing capacitor to change the whole scale of the range. So um, it's very, very simple. Uh, I did check. I've got some thermal images. I had some thermal images. I do have thermal images. I wondered how hot the resistor in the Zener would get. The Zener goes up to about 31.8 degrees centigrade, which is nothing. It's negligible. It's quite a low heat. The hottest component on the actual other circuit board is a diode. And it turns out it's this diode, and only when it's actually passing the current uh, from the power supply, which isn't that much, it's only milliamps, but more importantly when it's passing the relay current, it's, it's not a huge current. Uh, in the off state, the current consumption was 8 milliamp, which is most most of that's just going through this zener. It's hardly anything being drawn by this chip. But in the on state, it goes up to about 86 milliamps, so about 80 milliamps running through this coil. And the coil itself gets up to about... 47 degrees Celsius, uh, 48, uh, 48 degrees Celsius here, which again, it's not that bad. I'm wondering if the 24 volt ones would actually get a lot hotter in the sense that ultimately they would probably use a higher value of resistor. I hope they would use a higher value of resistor, but it would be dropping a lot more current across that resistor so it could get hotter and the coil could get hotter. So I would say uh, I'd, my preference would be the, for the 12 volt ones. Uh, but the 24 volt, volt ones are probably okay. I've not looked at the 240 volt ones. I really should get one of those and see how the circuitry differs. I'm guessing, oh no, I'm not sure. I wonder if it will use a thyristor track to switch the coil. Um, it will use the same chip most likely, but it will have different power supply circuitry. Probably a little capacitive dropper crammed in here. Not really sure. Uh, maybe just a resistor because it is very low current. Um, and it'll just be a hot resistor inside and then an extra hot coil as seems to happen in the 240 volt ones. But they do these in 12, 24, 48, 110 and 220 to 240 volt ones coils. But they're a very useful component, uh, very useful indeed. Again, as with all these components, I wouldn't necessar necessarily recommend using them in a professional application where it would be expensive if things broke down or, you know, there could be a liability issue if, if this was a safety feature, although you should have extra safety features as well. But um, for certainly for home experimentation or little home projects, this looks actually OK, particularly the low voltage one. Um, so, yeah, actually quite a nice little gadget. Very useful indeed.